Palantir, we have some pretty big information here about Palantir. I actually saw this video last night from Amit, and um, who's a uh, you know in the Palantir community in a major way. And I wanted to react to a part of this video here today because this is significant. If you're somebody that's you know been buying Palantir stock, or you're thinking like how much longer can I buy for certain prices and things like that. Um, what we're going to talk about in this video matters in a pretty significant way for the stock price of Palantir. Okay. It matters a slight amount for the fundamentals of Palantir, and I'll explain why it matters for a slight amount in the fundamentals, but this is absolutely an extremely important thing for the stock price of Palantir. So if you're thinking like, how long do I have to add this stock at certain prices and things like that, this matters in a significant way, and I'll kind of share in this video my thoughts on this as well as react to obviously Amit and uh, hear what he has to say in regards to this. So hope you guys enjoy this as always. I appreciate everybody as always uh, you know, being here. Thanks for being subscribed, 25,700 plus subscribers now at this point in time. Uh, just about an hour ago or so, I made my moves in the Patreon portfolio. I bought three stocks. One of them might have been Palantir. If you want access to see all the moves I'm making every week in that account, buys and sells, uh, check out the pinned comment down there. That will be to join us in there. And also, just so you guys know, I'm going to likely be getting rid of the $10 tier pretty soon here. Um, so basically everybody that's in that tier will be grandfathered, um, whenever I get rid of that, which will probably be pretty soon. I'm just going to have the one $19 tier, which will be for all that access plus a discord chat. Okay. So if you want to get in for the $10 tier, you, you better do it soon. That's all I'll say about that. Okay. All right. Let's get into this. Here's why. So the S&P 500 is an equity index made up of the, uh, of the largest 500 companies in either the NYSE, NASDAQ, or SBOE. Let me zoom in just a little bit. The S&P 500 is calculated by adding each company's float adjusted market cap. In order to be included, you have to have at least a $12.7 billion market cap. Palantir has that. A majority of your shares in public hands. Palantir has that. And be a public company for at least one year. Palantir has that. Then the other thing is actually becoming profitable. So um, you have to have at least a quarter million of its shares trade in each of the previous six months. Most shares in the public hand have a positive sum of the previous four quarters of earnings as well as the most recent quarter. So the S&P 500, for those super unfamiliar with it, is just a index fund of the 500 largest companies in, in America, um, uh, or I believe across the entire world. Um, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and I'm forgetting, and Microsoft comprise 20% of the S&P 500. Um, so the other 495 companies comprise the other 80%, which is kind of insane, right? Five companies comprise 20%. Apple's about already 7.5% of the S&P 500. So, tr you know, when you buy those, when you buy the index, you're buying a, a significant piece of those five companies. And when you buy these five companies, you're also- It's true, but I will say this, okay? The weighting is far better than the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Do you know how they do the weighting on the Dow Jones Industrial Average? It's the worst idea in the world. Basically, the heaviest weights are whatever the share price is the most. Not market cap, share price. So you could have a stock that's $500 and its market cap is $5 billion. You could have a stock that's $5 and its market cap is $500 billion. And the $5 billion company with a higher stock price will be the much heavier weight in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Like, it doesn't make any sense, okay? So in regards to this, Palantir could be getting in the S&P 500 since the, the rule changes for the S&P 500 here um, in regards to founders uh, in terms of, you know, being able to have these founder shares, uh, founder share type companies be able to and now get into the S&P 500 if you can meet the other criteria such as profitability, obviously. It influences the larger index because if these companies drop on a day, then, you know, the S&P 500 will drop on a day as well. Uh, I want to go to this article from... From from November twenty here we go from November twenty twenty, uh, and this is what happened when Tesla was going to be included into the S and P five hundred. So Tesla so stock has jumped nearly forty percent since the announcement that it would join the index, bringing its year to date gain to nearly five hundred eighty percent. That was twenty twenty was a crazy year, but they announced it around June July of twenty twenty that they were going to be included, and November. Uh, is when it started to ultimately start happening. And I think by December, it fully happened. Uh, there is currently over 11.2 trillion assets benchmarked to the S&P 500 with roughly 4.6 trillion of those in total index funds, according to the S&P Dow Jones indices. So Tesla, we saw it go up 40% just within those four months of the announcement that it was getting included into the S&P 500. Now, Tesla is not, uh, Palantir is not Tesla. I don't think that's going to happen in this case. I don't think we get the... Um, 40% run up the same way it does unless earnings you know go really well over the next uh, Yeah as as somebody that was an investor at Tesla at that that time right 
Tesla had a fundamental story plus S&P 500 excitement, okay? And why this matters so significantly is when it comes to S&P 500, like, you know, basically it's a forced buy situation. If you are somebody that runs an index fund, let's say for instance, right? And you're somebody that's buying into an S&P 500 index fund, all the stocks get bought across that entire uh, index fund, right? So that's an important part for somebody like a Palantir or Tesla or whoever could get in the S&P 500 over time was all of a sudden now you have a forced buyer come in. It's not just like random people like me and I don't know, admit uh, buying Palantir stock or you guys or whatever, right? All of a sudden now it's, it's, it's institutions and it's massive inflows of money, sometimes millions, tens of millions of dollars in just a weekly period that wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for being an S&P 500. So being an S&P 500 is the holy grail. It is the holy grail of, of you know, being a stock in the public markets, in my opinion. It, it is the Super Bowl. You get an S&P 500, that's the Super Bowl. Because now you have a massive amount of people that are basically just going to buy it. Because so many people buy S&P 500 index funds. Like, it's, it's like the most popular, right? So that, that matters in an extremely, extremely significant way for Palantir. Orders. But what it does show is that investors want your company to be included in the S&P 500. Why? Thousands of institutional hedge fund managers, capital allocators, large institutions, investors, et cetera, need to have exposure to your company, need to have a piece of your company if it's included in the S&P 500. Yep. Because if they're owning a piece of the S&P 500, they are theoretically owning a piece of your business. Palantir has largely not been exposed to the vast majority of institutional investors of the world for a variety of reasons. One of them is they haven't been profitable. One of them is uh, you know they, they've been struggling to maintain above six, seven dollars worth of, of a stock price. Uh, business a little bit of a black box, right? Companies don't really know exactly what they do. They haven't been the best at marketing, getting their word out there. They've only been a public company for about two years now. They haven't grown you know exponentially, so they haven't really been on the public radar to be able to be included in all these other institutions. I'll push back against the grown. They They've grown like a beast. I mean, uh, you know, extremely strong growth uh, compared to most companies. I mean, think about think about people like Gary Black, right? That run a hedge fund that's pri primarily rooted in, in, in investing in Tesla. Um, let's say he believed in Palantir. Let's say just like he has a, a portfolio allocation to Google. Let's say he did some research on Palantir and really believed in it. He could invest in Palantir. Right? He's an institutional investor, and that would be good because not only does he have massive influence, but um, that is another institution, even if it's a small institution in, 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 in the broad scheme of things, entering into Palantir. I just met with a hedge fund about a month ago in New Jersey, not a hedge fund, like an investment fund that bought Palantir shares at five bucks in 2018. They got invited to FounderCon, right? They're close with the company, and they have a significant position in that company, and they want that position to, to, to pan out over the next decade. And so th there are little mom and pop, you know, funds that like the one I visited, which is you know, it's a lot of money, but it's not billions of dollars. And then there's billion dollar institutional funds that could get access to Palantir as a result of it being included in the S&P 500. And it gets the global name recognition that is required for the company to actually start uh, getting eaten up by investors. Alex Karp, as much as he hates Wall Street, uh, he recognizes how important this is, which is why he put out this letter. Uh, the, the letter was actually philosophically crafted in an interesting way, right? Because he was trying to justify why they haven't been eligible for inclusion outside of profitability because of this whole idea of like founder-led visions and companies. And I resonate with it. A lot of shareholders might not resonate with it. They're like, screw you, like, you know, to get the stock price up, we don't care about your founder-led vision. But I mean, if you're investing in Palantir, you're investing in the founder at the end of the day, right? You're investing in the guy that you think can get it done. That That is what the investment thesis is. That is why the risk-reward scenario might be asymmetrical and it might really be something good because you trust that founder has your interests aligned and really cares about the mission of the company. So uh, for me, a little different, um, you know, for me, it's really about uh, Palantir's product more than, than Alex Karp. And I know there's a lot of people that definitely own the stock because of Alex Karp and they really like him and, and whatnot. But for me, it's really been about the product and just being kind convinced that like it just seems like if you are a fortune 500 type company you're going to have to consider using palantir's product over the next few years um and, and i don't know if that can be said for many many companies out there in terms of like having to at least consider using the product doesn't mean you have to sign up for it but you gotta at least consider it right business stuff will work itself out if the mission gets executed and so him wanting to retain control i understand it even though i know a lot of investors do not and now that they are el eligible to be included in the S&P 500, it's just a question of can they become gap profitable? And that's why he put out that letter yesterday saying, hey, uh, this is the time for us to do it. I think it would be an embarrassment, honestly speaking, if they don't maintain gap profitability in Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 of this year, but they're like bragging about, you know, like why would you, 
A, why would you brag about being profitable the quarter before? And B, why would you make this letter? Like, why wouldn't you let it just go under the radar? Why do you want to bring attention? You know, get rid of those, get rid of those uh, operating margin slides in, in the deck. It's just like, you, you, right? Like, like there are certain slides Pouncer left off and they sh honestly shouldn't have left it off because some of the numbers look bad. Um, but why would you make this such a public thing about like, hey, if, if we're profitable, we get inside the S&P. It's like, just, just get profitable, <laughs> then just get into the S&P. Don't make it a big deal. And then the next month you're like, oh, by the way, we're not profitable. So this whole letter I sent out to become pro to like become the S&P, we don't even have a chance to get into it for another four quarters versus now it's another three quarters. So yeah, so my thought process on it, you know, in terms of why CARP did this and then also in terms of like, you know, Palantir stock price and what this means for Palantir stock price in the shorter term and, and all those sorts of things. Okay. So in, in regards to I think Carp's taking the stock price more serious. I know he probably acts like, you know, he doesn't pay attention to it or whatever. And the reason being is not because he's like, oh, it's got to be $20 or I don't feel good about myself. But ultimately, you got to understand, a significant amount of the owners of Palantir are employees of the company. And so stock prices do end up mattering in a significant way to your employee force, Okay. And I think this is just another reason why Zuckerberg, I don't think Zuckerberg cares that much about the short-term stock price, but I think he has to care now because, let's be honest, a lot of meta employees are compensated with meta stock. And so if your stock price keeps going down, it gives an overall bad vibe and feeling for your empl entire employee force, right? And so for Palantir, we know they've given tons of stock-based compensation to their employee force. And when your stock price is seven, eight bucks, I mean... You know, that's not going to make your employee force feel that, uh, let's call it, excited to go to work each day. They want to see that stock price at $15, $20, $30, $40, right? And then they really feel like they're, they're making a change. They're doing a great job. So it matters in a very, very significant way, much more so than I think a lot of people realize because of, because of stock-based compensation. If your employee force doesn't own any stock, then it doesn't matter. And there's a lot of companies out there that, you know, their employee forces don't own it. But when you're a big tech company like a Palantir or a Meta or a Tesla, I'm telling you, your stock price matters significantly. And if it does well enough, I mean, some of your employees might end up at leaving you over time because, you know, they make so much money off stock. I know that certainly happened with Tesla, but um, it, it matters. It matters a significant way, okay? Now, in regards to Palantir, you know, and kind of my thought process on this, you know, I really think, like, the next six to nine months is really, uh, I don't want to say like the last time to get in Palantir because you always buy the stock in the future, but it's just, it feels like it's, it's at one of those moments where you kind of have to add this stock if you are a buyer of this stock and add it as aggressively as possible here. Because if you're talking about this stock actually gets in the SP 500, which it's a possibility if they can, you know, continue to put up gap profitable quarters and you know, they're going to be in the SP 500 because of the market cap. I mean, I can tell you before you get into the S&P 500, there's a huge influx of people that start buying your stock because they're like, oh, they're about to get in. So as you get closer and closer to getting in the S&P 500, there's a lot of people that take advantage of that arbitrage. People took advantage of that arbitrage with Tesla and they actually, there's people that in funds and investors, they keep an eye just for the next companies that are going to be in the S&P 500. And they take advantage of that little arbitrage between the time period where it's like, oh, they're, they're, they might potentially get in and the time they actually get in because they realize once they get in, then there's a big forced buying that happens. Okay. So in regards to something like a Palantir, it's a much actually smaller market cap than Tesla was when, when Tesla got in the SP 500. I mean, by the time Tesla got in the SP 500, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember what Tesla's market cap was back then. It might have been it might have been 100 or 200 billion dollars. I can't quite remember, but I can tell you it was massively more than Palantir. That is 100% something I know. And so, you know, don't be surprised if Palantir's stock price performs better and better and better over the next several quarters if Palantir can continue to put up gap profitability, continue to put up nice revenue numbers, and then you have this carrot out there that's S&P 500 inclusion, that's also when you start talking about stock going back over 10 bucks, 12 bucks, 14 bucks again, okay? So this is just something to kind of keep in mind here. It matters significantly. And last piece is for the fundamentals. Why does this matter at all for the fundamentals? It actually slightly matters for the fundamentals of the company. Being in the S&P 500 is like huge for branding of your business. It means you made it. Your credibility goes up. And it goes up quite dramatically being in the SP 500. It really does. 
when you become an S&P 500, it's like becoming a Fortune 500 company. You have that branding behind you. And it is powerful. And other companies, which, let's be honest, Palantir sells to other companies, right? And they sell to governments. They do look at that stuff. They do. They do pay attention to, you know, the product and service. They do pay attention to, are you in the SP 500? Are you that sort of credible company? It's like, um, you know, getting in. Let's just call it that. You're getting in. And uh, you made it. And so it does actually matter. And some folks do actually look at that. And, and say, oh, is this an SP 500 company? Oh, is this a Fortune 500 company? It's more exposure. It's more branding. It's more investment funds looking at you, being forced to look at you that wouldn't have looked at you before to invest in you and to look into your product. Because, gosh, maybe their product can actually help you as a business, right? Like when you just are in that, that realm, it's huge. It's huge for you, okay? So matters significantly. So as far as me personally, I'm going to continue to use this year. It's just an aggressive adder of Palantir. And – I might have bought more Palantir stock here today, folks, and uh, just going to continue to add this one this entire year because I don't. I think once this one takes off, I don't think it's coming back. That's just my belief on it. Kind of similar to what happened with Tesla. And I'm not saying it's going to go up nearly as much as Tesla, but once this baby takes off, I don't. I don't think it's coming back to seven, eight bucks. That's just my personal opinion on uh, this one. Okay, so appreciate everybody joining me as always. Much love, guys. I appreciate you. And uh, thanks for being subscribed. If you're looking to join us in the, the Patreon, that's going to be pinned comment down there to see the moves I'm making here today and making next week as well. And once again, that $10 tier will be going away soon. So if you want to get grandfathered in, um, you're going to need to join that ASAP there. Appreciate y'all. Much love and have a great day.